Life Rhythms with Ryan Sky. Observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. Welcome back to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky, Adobe Family. I'm excited today. My guest joining me from San Francisco on Zoom is Evan White, known by his fan base as Vandalux. Evan, welcome to Life Rhythms. Thanks so much. Thanks for having it's me. It's good to have you on the show. Um, so you, you're a multi multi instrumentalist, producer, vocalist. You're originally based in Vancouver. I'm wondering, like, what is it about Vancouver? Because we, like, we we just had um, whipped cream on the show. I've had Felix Cartel on twice. Um, we've had Bob Moses on. We've got you on. Like, there's a lot of great music coming out of Vancouver. You know, there is, and. Um definitely has helped inspire me you know making my own music and listening to um a handful of people you just mentioned growing up but i think there's just a lot of well two things one there's a lot of natural beauty in vancouver uh which i think a lot of people find very inspiring and a lot of different music influences um in canada in general is also just very supportive of artists there's a lot of mm -hmm. grants and ways that the Canadian government and other private organizations can help Canadian artists. Um, you know, like I was looking at, I think it was last year, three of the top five artists in the world were Canadian. It was like Drake, Justin Bieber, and The wow. Weeknd, you know, mm. and for a country with a population that's smaller than California, it's, it's pretty, pretty that's impressive. That's interesting. So, I, I, I didn't think yeah, about that, but yeah, that, I guess they are from Canada. Yeah. Oh yeah. I haven't been to Vancouver, but it's yeah. I've I've just seen it in video and documentaries and movies and stuff and it looks so insanely beautiful. Like you've got to just like pinch yourself, I bet when you're there, when you're looking around. It is. It's a very very pretty city. Uh, but it also rains a lot. I think it's like 300 days a year mm, it's raining. 300. So wow. <laughs> most people in LA, yeah, that, that's a bit of a deterrent, but um when it's sunny or when there's snow on the mountains, uh, it's it's a good day. I grew up, up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, it's got a similar weather to Seattle. Uh, very gloomy because a lot of lake effect weather from Lake Erie's just north of the city. And um, it wasn't until I moved to New York City I didn't realize that it could be winter and it could snow, and then like it could you could have a blue sky afterwards. I didn't know that was possible. It would snow in New yeah. York, and then the clouds would part, and it would be like a beautiful sunny blue sky day and i was like oh my god we never had that we don't have this in pittsburgh it's just usually just gray yeah we do get those <laughs> occasionally um yeah there's nothing better when that happens it's really, really i want to nice. highlight so your name vandalux it's a it's a combination of um cities you've lived in so vancouver is it where's is it deland deland where is that land yeah um I school in oh. florida it's sort of central florida North okay. Florida, I'm like, is uh, that in Europe? <laughs> I was playing. Yeah, yeah, no. Luxembourg is, third, which is yeah. the third one, but um, to land, I was playing soccer quite competitively growing up in Canada. And so ended up uh, sort of playing Division One soccer in the US and went to a school called Stetson, which is in Deland, Florida. And I was listening to very different music there than I was in Vancouver. <laughs> Um, so the three cities combined sort of represent the different styles of music that I listen to each city that sort of helped influence the, I guess, the sound. And we're featuring now. your album today, When the Light Breaks. And I want to go over the songs that I'd love to play. And we're going to play little snippets for our listeners so they can follow along as we're going through the album. And um, I was wondering, so let's start with what... Like what, what, what do we need to know? Like, what could you tell us about like early young Evan? Like what are like, what, what is, what are like memories of when you were a child? Something that we, something that's like a formidable part of your past that would like give us context of who we're meeting today on the show. So I say I'm from Vancouver. I grew up in a, a city outside of Vancouver, maybe half an hour South. So actually we're right next to the U S border. Um, you know, our family would go and do grocery shopping and gas in the U.S. because it was cheaper than it was in Canada. But this is also back when, you know, pre-COVID, when it was a lot easier to get across things the border. Things have changed. <laughs> um, things have changed, yeah. Uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, my child, I had a good childhood. You know, I, my memories of childhood are, are, we grew up in 
you know, this is a Canadian beach. It's very different than an LA beach, but close to the water. And so our summers are great there. And so we had, um, you know, we just ride around on bikes and see where our friends were. And uh, this is before phones and text messages, and not phones, text messages <laughs> before and phones. iPhones. <laughs> but you just know. <laughs> not before phones, <laughs> but um, as kids, we didn't have to use things. And so uh, you just know where your friends were based on how many bikes were piled out front of the, you know, the next house's yard. And that's kind of how you tracked everyone down. Um, so, yeah, I'd say like summers growing up was sort of the, the highlight for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, like when I was young, you know, I was doing piano lessons at a pretty young age and, and didn't really like it, but glad I sort of stuck with it. And that sort of helped to shape the music trajectory later on in life for sure. Yeah. I, I play piano as well. And it's, it's challenging that the initial years of learning the fundamentals, cause you got to get through, you know, you've got to get through the basics and a lot of people have trouble sticking with it through like jingle bells and Mary had a little lamb and stuff. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. But so you, yeah, the music is the tough part for sure. And once, once you start getting technical with music, that's where, that's where I started to struggle a bit. This episode is brought to you by mixillary.com. I'm excited to have Mixillary on as a sponsor personally because Mixillary is a platform that you can use to find and hire someone to remix your song. And why that's so important is because anybody can go online and you can search music producers, you can search for remixers, you can hire somebody, but it's like, how much do you pay them and who should you hire and what genre should you choose? And with option overload, it can be a little overwhelming to figure out what's the best use of your money. Because what it comes down to is that remixes are marketing tools. A remix of a record will get that record in front of a larger audience. It will get that record played in venues and areas like the gym or a club or a you know, car or a fitness studio, places that maybe your original song may not be appropriate for. So it is an important marketing tool, but then who remixes it is important because first of all, the quality of the remix and also maybe they have their own audience that's going to discover this remix. Maybe they have a following. Maybe they have a radio show. Maybe they tour and they'll be playing it out live. These are all sorts of things that are important. So Mixillary is a service that that will help match you with the best remixer for your budget. So check out mixillary.com for more information on this. But yeah, Do you I come from a musical one. family? Uh, so my, my mom's a really good okay. piano player. Um, my dad, uh, I don't think he played any instruments, but definitely has a big appreciation for, for just music in, in general. Um, you know, I grew up listening to like the band and REM and, and um, a lot of these kind of like, 70s 80s rock groups uh quite a bit um so and i've got two brothers uh, my younger brother is starting to pick up piano now as well but so not like a crazy music family but a family that definitely appreciated music all the way through at what point you said you were listening to different music when you were in florida what was it that you were listening yeah. to down there <laughs> I mean, in Florida, it's it's tough to get away from like a Southern rap, Southern hip hop. You know, you just hear that everywhere. It's on the radio. It's it's um it's everywhere. So, and like that hip hop, that rap is very different from like when I was in Vancouver, I was big into like '90s hip hop and like you know Biggie and J Five and Tribe Called Quest and and that was very different from what I was hearing down in Florida. It was all like Rick Ross and like, you know, more sort of very 808 heavy sub heavy stuff. Um, so yeah, that was the, the first exposure to like proper Southern hip hop. That's so interesting. Sure. How did you find your way to your current sound? Because it's described here as a balance between retro nostalgia with contemporary electronic production. Like, I'd love to know how you found your way into this genre because like for, like I can relate to your story because I grew up also listening to hip hop and r and I didn't even really like dance music cause, just because I wasn't exposed to it. I grew up in the country. And then it wasn't until in college I was a bartender in, in the city at a club and then just being at the club every weekend. It was that, it was that time where um, you had the, merge, the merging of um, pop and and house influences like you know, like Lady Gaga's "Just Dance" and like Chris Brown's. Um, he had a, a series of songs that were out, and like um, uh, J Lo's "Dance Again," you know. So you had this infusion of like Red One production, and so once I started to see the club environment, and I got to actually experience like the, the I guess the vibe of electronic music, and kind of see the way it in affected people. 
first of all, it didn't all sound the same to me anymore like it did before. Like I started to get the nuances. But that's where my appreciation for it came. But I started out on hip hop and kind of like found my way into dance. I'd love to know like how did you how did you find your way into this into this genre that you've you're in now? Yeah. I think like hip hop was probably the first music I fell in love with because it's just fun and there's this huge storytelling elements to hip hop that, that um was just new and risky and unique and different um that I kind of fell in love with in high school and I also loved how creative hip hop is with sounds with sampling with music production with you know it was simple but um but very creative and it was sort of new sounds that I hadn't listened to through like the old rock records that wow. my dad was playing when I was very young. So I think there was a fascination there. Um, you know, the music I make now is it's electronic, but um, with sort of like a lean towards songwriting. So there's the melodic elements to it. Um, you know, it's not like just straight EDM where, it's all about just the beat. Like I try to tell stories and, and I do my own vocals on most of the songs. And so I think like, you know, and when I was in Vancouver as well, I was listening to a lot of like Ben Harper and Jack Johnson and these kind of early singer songwriters for me. And so really the music I'm trying to make now is I guess just sort of like a blend of the things that I like from those, from those different categories. So there's some sampling involved that, you know, I picked up from early hip hop days. Um, I really fell in love with sound design, you know, for my stuff. I'm not like taking splice samples. I'm, I'm creating the sounds myself. And that's what I'm really, really passionate about to do something new and unique that no one's heard before, you know, is, yeah. is the goal. Um, but then combining it with like a singer songwriter elements so that you're also telling a story and, you know, it's not just like straight techno, like it's kind of blend of the, of the, of, of, of the group, but I've definitely bounced around a lot and I think just continuing to stay inspired, you sort of have to change up your style and try different stuff. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's, that's the fun in it. As I definitely well. hear all of these influences in the music. I want to jump to, I want to jump to the songs um, specifically on this topic of the sampling. I was thinking of, let's see, I'm looking at my notes here. I think it's, Oh, it's Leave It Alone. I want to I want to play a little bit of Leave It Alone. This might be one of my favorite songs on the sure. album. Um I love the moodiness of it. Okay. I love the attitude. It's got a lot of character in in the attitude and I love the vocal chops that you've got going on in this. The sound design choices, the samples, like I want to ask you about all this stuff. So, I'm going to play a little bit of this. Leave It Alone. You know it's hard to believe. That since you come back home You turned yourself around And now you understand You've never been so wrong Could you leave it alone? I love this You should leave that alone Let the sky roll on There's that hip hop influence. Only wanna call me when the roof so hot. My heart on my peed in the sling shot. You know I can't sleep with the doors unlocked. Stand up when the rhyme and the reason is in the Samples. Yes. Yeah, I love this one. What can you tell us about the sound design Thanks. and the samples and stuff that you use for this? 
Yeah, so this one, um, I started off with sort of the fully baked instrumental with the sample chops and all that. Um, and I just couldn't figure out a top line for it uh, and reached out to Tyler Mann, who's become a good friend, but he he kind of randomly reached out to me over email and was like, hey, I've been listening to your music. I'd love to like work on something. And he sent some demos through and they were really, really good. And so we just connected over the internet and started writing music together. Um, but I sent him this. I was like, hey, I'm working on this one right now. It's It's a bit more sort of lower tempo. It's got a bit of a hip hop feel to it. Could you write something over it? And like in 24 hours, he, he came back with just a really good idea for the top line and like rapping through that section and everything. And so it it came together quite quickly. But um, yeah, the samples in that, in that sort of breakdown section are from, I, I found this archive of these like 19, I think it's 1960s educational documentary wow. films. And they're 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 old enough that you're sort of past like the copyright period so it becomes um like common property for people to use for free and it's it's just the most like ludicrous videos that they used to show in the schooling system like in the south back in the 60s and um the videos are hilarious but it's all about like teaching kids how they should be and morals and like money and telling the truth and all this stuff so it creates an opportunity for really good samples and so i just chopped that up and um kind of worked into the breakdown so interesting and i like the distortion effects that you have on his voice is that is that your voice oh or yeah his voice? yeah that's, that's it. it for his that, voice, that right? song it's his yeah, voice. yeah. It's but i like the vocal chain that you have on there the like some of the distortion oh yeah thanks oh yeah thanks yeah we uh we worked for a while on that i think that was actually uh nico pop who's a producer in la that recorded for Tyler. And when he sent through the vocal file, um, he'd suggested sort of using that, that, um, there's kind of like two different vocals and the one that's sitting below is this, um, kind of, uh, reverberating, um, copy of his vocal, but it, yeah, it adds for kind of a cool effect yeah. there. Um, okay. So yeah, that, that's probably one of my favorites on the album. Um, do you have is there a song what is your favorite songs on this album do you have a favorite um yeah i think it's probably changed over time i the thing i i struggle with in music is you know it's tough when you're creating a song because you put so much effort and so much time and thought into something that usually by the time you finish it you're so tired of yes, hearing it I can and, relate. And so great right so like to create music that you're you're proud of and feel good about over the long term is really challenging i, th I think with this album is the first time that you know now that i'm sort of six months or eight months past the release i can look back and still feel good about it i still feel like you know this was this was a solid representation of how i felt um over the past few years and so um i guess to answer your question favorite song it's probably changed i think looking back on it maybe all i've ever known is a favorite song for me um yeah i'd probably say that one at least at least right now that's the one that kind of still means a lot i want to play a little to bit me. of it all um, i've ever known okay, okay. sure I like this one too. You have like, a, is it like a down pitched effect on the vocal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I pitched it down. Um, it's called like a format knob that I've pitched it down a few. Yeah, tones. I love that because it adds extra soul to it. I, I it, that I never get sick of that effect. It just really adds another element to a song. 
Yeah, I think like I started, I've got that on a few of my songs. I think I started doing it because everyone kind of hates the sound of their own voice. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this was a way for me to like hear it a bit differently and come up with something that, that um, I wouldn't hear back and be like, oh, that's what yeah. I sound like, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I've got a few tracks on this album that, that, uh, or hiding behind the, the vocal change. I wanted to ask you about these lyrics. I, I do have this in my notes for the song. Uh, so it's it's all it's all that I know. It's all I've ever known. I'm trying, but I can't escape the truth. I'm better on my own. I was like, hmm, interesting. I'm better on my own. It's all I've ever known. I'm better on my own. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Um, how How autobiographical is this song? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely an element from sort of my own personal experience there, um, but probably not an experience that I'm alone on. I'm sure other people feel this as well, but I think the song and the lyrics came from a place of, you know, there's a lot of relationships that I've found myself in, whether it's a relationship with a partner or a friend or whatever, where um, you feel like you have to change who you are to be compatible with that person you know and it's tough to recognize at the start but usually if you are in a relationship like that where you're changing who you are to be with that person it just creates problems down the road and so the song is kind of about realizing like who you are fundamentally who you are at your core and you know i'm not saying that like i don't think people can change i do think people can change who they are and better themselves but if you're changing specifically for the needs of someone else um it's usually a fruitless endeavor you know and so um all i've ever known is about i guess like recognizing like hey we're two different people and um i can't continue to change who i am to be with you and i think i'm just Oof, better on yeah. my own setting a boundary it's not it's not a bad thing it's a good thing to do that to kind of totally to kind of recognize yeah. but tough to recognize mm -hmm. well you know it's it's very tough to, it's tough to recognize like I've, I've spent many years in that position and just realizing you know taking a while to realize that uh you know this this isn't working out so yeah hmm yeah do you do you keep like a small circle or do you have like are, are you do you because i'm thinking about the theme of spending time on your own like, do you, do you like a lot of alone time or are you the kind of person that you need a lot of people around you? I think I'm definitely, I'm a bit of a loner. I like, I like my alone time, but, um, I also think I need personal connection and friends just like everyone else does. But, um, I like it in short bursts, you know, I think I'm an introvert, um, naturally, and I've had to, especially this past year, now that I'm touring and playing shows in front of people, which is all like relatively new to me, you sort of have to train yourself to be extroverted and to get energy from these events. But there's a long period and build up before the events where I really just need to, you know, be alone and, and be in my own little bubble, and um, uh, which is good and bad, right? Like it's good because... I'm able to carve that time out for myself now and create the music I want to create. But I also like desperately want to work with other artists and do collaborations and being an introvert. It's just, it's sometimes tough to kind of make that connection with other artists and to be comfortable in a room with them where you can sit down and be yourself and like produce your best work and get them to produce their best work. Uh, so that's my, that's my goal for this year is doing more in-person sessions and being more comfortable. Yeah. That's the people. challenge is you, you get in a room, like people who don't, people who don't write music, uh, write songs, they, they don't really know the experience of like getting in the room with a stranger. And it's like the whole process of writing a song is a very intimate experience. And then, but then also you're just meeting this person for the first time and you're trying to connect with them, trying to find common ground, something you can write about, but, and then also like have ho hope that maybe some magic can come out of this experience. And then also you've got all, yeah. I, when I say you, I mean me or whomever, like we've got our, all of our whatever internal stories and insecurities and stuff that we're dealing with as we're meeting this person. Like, and it's also a very vulnerable thing to have an idea and share it and be like, well, what about this idea? What about that? And to, and to kind of like, 
you know, it's it's kind of because because you're 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 throwing out ideas, and at least for me, I always feel vulnerable when I'm sharing ideas. But I try to push. I try to push through. Totally. It, you know, for the sake of the of the song and the project. Yeah, and some people are really some people are really good at it, and some people are also really good at making other people feel comfortable and get their best yes. ideas out. You know, and that's also like that's also key. And I think. You know, I haven't done that many in-person sessions with other artists, but I've done enough to know that most of my energy goes towards trying to make the other artist comfortable and let down my guard. But then I struggle to like do that yeah. myself, you know? So I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough, but um, thankfully these days there's the internet and it, it makes it a lot easier to kind of like collaborate with other people, but also have your own space and come up with what you want to do and, take your time with it and bounce things back pressure. and forth yeah when you're preparing for your live show yeah. so you just you just debuted right at crossed fest is that right so cross was one of the first festivals um we did so our first show was in march last year we did we, we planned like four shows starting in san francisco um and all of them sold out which was amazing it kind of kick-started us to do more shows. I think we ended up doing 18 or 20 shows last year. Uh, and we're sort of off to the races this year. So doing a bunch of festivals, um, some more shows. Uh, and yeah, it's going to be busy, but um, What was it exciting. like playing these songs live for the first time? Because you, you're making them, a lot, of the, a lot of this you're making on your own, in your own space, hoping that it'll translate live or not quite sure how people will react live, right? And that moment of like playing it for the first time it's exciting, but also it's like, uh, how's this going to go? Terrifying. Yeah. But terrifying. Yeah. It's like so terrifying. But, um, and there's a challenge with the type of music that I'm making and like any electronic musician is you sort of have to choose a path. It's like, you're either going the DJ route and you're going to be doing DJ sets and traveling with a USB stick, or you're going to try to do the songs live. And I think with, my tracks because i am doing instrumentation and doing most of the singing on the tracks it made sense to try to go the live route like more sort of like rufus or elderbrook or these other artists are doing um but the challenge there is you sort of have to like it's not like a band where you go and you show up every day and you rehearse and you practice and you just as you're writing the song you're playing it live right for an, an electronic musician you're making these songs piece yeah. by piece and so when you go to tour for me i had to look at this and sort of reverse engineer each song and figure out like okay if i were to break this down how would i play this live and you know i can't play all i can't do like the drums and bass and everything together so what sections can i loop what sections can be on playback which sections can i like punch out and play the keys for and do the vocals for so it becomes quite challenging to figure that out and there was a lot of months that went into figuring out that live show but the goal was like i want to do as much of this live as i can even if it's not going to sound as good because i want that like vulnerability on stage i want like when i go to show i want to see people screw up or not yeah, hit yeah. every note you know like, i want to see something real and um for me it, it was a lot more rewarding to go through that process and figure out that, that live elements as opposed to just having like you know playing a dj set and i love doing dj sets too but this this to me was like a challenge that was worth putting the time yeah, you're into. Fi finishing the song and then it's like okay how are we going to do this live you kind of have to like work your way back from there yeah. how has it been yeah. doing it live how's it i mean now that you've done all these shows i'm sure you got it down but how was it like the first few shows how did it go i think like the first show being in san francisco having a lot of my friends at the show was like definitely a confidence boost. You know, I was, I was terrified, but it's not like, you know, presenting at work in front of like your boss yeah. where people are super skeptical. So you're, you're going into an environment where everyone's on your side and they're there to party. And they're there to have fun. And I think like it took a few shows to pick up on that where it's like, everyone's here just to have fun. And like, if you screw up, no worries. Like just play through it. And I think that's helped to like the first few shows went really well and it helped to sort of build my confidence as, as I went through the year. And 
And now I'm a lot less nervous when I go on stage and I can have, I can enjoy it a lot more too. And like, you know, feed off of what the crowd's giving back to me. And, um, so yeah, it's definitely been a, a development year, but it's been really, really fun. In How the long process. are your sets when you're doing it? The live version? Like how long you have to go? So you start off around 50 minutes. Um, the last few I've done were a bit longer. I think it was sort of like an hour, 15, hour and 20 ish. Um, so I think that seems like a good length for me. Um, so yeah, probably that going forward. Okay. Uh, I want to play some more of these songs on here. What, one thing that I thought was interesting is one of the most popular songs on the album is Matter of Time. I think it's the most most streamed matter of time but and when i listen to it it's just it's just one line right repeated the whole way through it's it's uh it's just a matter of time before i lose my mind and and it's repeated yeah. the whole way through and i thought that's so interesting why is this song so popular huh. <laughs> i wonder well what, what yeah. do you think is it no, i think what do you think it is i think people love simplicity i mean if you look at look at like you know Who's an art like Daft Punk, mm. for example? The, the songs that them are also like around, just the world, one around the you world, know, people... around the world, around the world, around the world. It's like all you it know, is. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so um, sometimes you don't need a lot of words to convey your message, and people want to. You know, people do like simplicity, and I think that was a song that came together very, very quickly. Um, it came together essentially in an afternoon from idea to recording it to mixing it etc um and usually like the ones that the ones that like i'm usually most proud of are the ones that it's kind of like cutting paper through um or sorry cutting through like wrapping paper you know it just yeah. starts gliding and that process of like like sometimes when the song just glides all the way through it might be simple but um uh, you usually get to the end quickly for, for a reason. So, yeah. And that one was like, that came together during COVID right at the beginning of COVID. And, um, I was like literally losing my mind is when everyone's locked in their, <laughs> their rooms yeah. and it was kind of great for, for like music producers because you have an excuse to just like for someone who's a loner and likes to be alone and likes to just make stuff, um, in a closet. It was, uh, it was great but um it does kind of make you go a little bit stir crazy and so that's that's where the line came from um but yeah it seemed to resonate and connect with a lot of people at that time uh for, for probably for good reason i'm gonna play related. a little bit of it matter of time it's a great beach song the snaps all about alternative snares. What's, that? what's that i'm all about alternative snares finding different sounds for, for yeah snares. they're really really pleasing you had me you had mentioned for about sure. your sound design that you don't use splice and that you like to create a lot of your sounds how do you and that was i was going to planning on asking you about that today was how how do you go about finding your sounds how do you go about what draws you to certain sounds like what do you look for what do you try to create yeah i shouldn't say i don't use splice i do use it i do use it sometimes but it's kind of a last okay. resort right like i there's a lot of producers that are that will like find like a like a four bar drum loop and they're like here's my yeah. drums you know or find like an entire top line and they're like yeah. here's my song um but uh, which like, you know, if you're doing that great. And I think for a lot of people that, that, uh, you know, don't have a top line or they're not songwriters, like it's a great, great tool. Um, but I think like for, for anything like strings or synth or bass or like any instrumentation sign, I'm usually just doing MIDI. So, um, like working on a patch or, 
finding a plugin that creates the right sound and recording it in through MIDI. Um, guitar stuff, I usually just go direct, so either through my amp or go direct into like an audio interface, um, play the guitar stuff out loud. Um, for vocals, just going through a mic. Um, so it, it, it's meant to be sort of organic and natural as it can be. Um, but there's times where if I'm like, oh, you know, I really want like the background of this song to sound like a subway station then you know i'll search on on splice for like an ambient subway yeah. noise and then chop that up and so it is a useful tool um but i tend to use it in moderation uh just to keep that like original feel and sound mm -hmm. to the music and i see behind you in the in your video you've got some cool what what are some of those synthesizers back there well, i see some i see some retro oh, here. yeah what's that up there yeah this is a subsequent 37 so it's really good for like bass. Um, is it analog? A lot of analog uh, sounds. Yeah. So this one's analog, and it's it's great. It gives a lot of like that really mm. gritty, gritty bass feel. Um, I use this actually in Matter of Time, which gives it that, that like. There's that bass that's kind of like it's like two tones. It's a polysynth, and has a bit of like grit over top of it. Um, and then this is a Juno X, which is kind of a combination of like juno 106 juno 80 and i think the original juno x um which is super fun this is new it's a digital synth but it's like a really well crafted digital synth um that's really great for like pads and and like lead synth and stuff like that a lot of character yeah for sure <laughs> okay i'm looking at some of the other songs here uh my I, so I, I was saying earlier that probably leave it alone was was one of my favorite songs and maybe my favorite off the album is i really like fly away i like the dark i like the saw yeah. the dark saw synth you have going on in the chorus i'm, I'm gonna play some of it yeah um and for that's the you know 106 oh, coming it? through oh uh, good I love Listen, i'm gonna play some yeah. of it and i also it, for me this song is like for me it reminds me of kind of like the dark side of desire and i i just, totally i like, yeah, the I like saw, that saw that saw synth that comes in in the chorus i feel like it just adds a lot of well it adds a lot of drama and i i really like i really like some drama in a song so <laughs> i'm a fan of that so okay this is fly away i'm gonna play some of this I have never known someone like you I have been waiting so long Trying to find the truth Winding up with you alone Staring down the same black road Desire runs through the both of us Every time the night takes off. There it is. I wanna fly away. Every time the night takes off. Yeah. I love that synth. I love it. Yeah. It's a good I use it tracks different variations of that of that patch um but yeah it's it's good it, it adds a good release for drops you know yeah it adds a lot of character and, and moodiness to the track mm, for sure when i saw the line when i was looking at the lyrics i have have never known someone like you i've i've been waiting so long i thought i can relate to that um i feel like for those of us that are well, in dating, it's kind of like you kind of meet, you kind of, it's, I, it's, I almost feel like I meet someone special like every three or so years, you know? It's like, but just the idea of like, I've waited so long, it's, I can relate to that because it's kind of like you date and date and date and date and eventually you meet somebody that you really connect with and then maybe it, maybe you end up with that person or maybe it runs its course and then you kind of go back into the dating pool and you know like it's going to be a while probably until you connect with someone like that again totally yeah and i think it's it's kind of about this like that initial stage where that initial high in that relationship where you've met someone and you're just like 
whoa, this could be amazing. And I just want to fly away with you right now. Right. But then there's like this also like you kind of know there might be this dark path that it may lead yeah. down, but it's more about feeling there's like the highs and lows and all that combined together into that one feeling so, winding up with yeah. you alone staring down the same black road like oh that's interesting visual <laughs> yeah yeah this may work this yeah. may not uh this is another this is another song that um tyler man so that there's two tyler man collaborations on the album the first was by your side and the second one's fly away or sorry um uh, the first was um, Leave It Alone. The second was Fly Away. My two favorite songs um, on the album. <laughs> so he was. <laughs> That's so I interesting. Know, I know. I know. You, you got to have to. I'm going to have to follow. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna check him out after this. That's so interesting. Hmm. He's an incredibly good songwriter. Um, and he's also one of the few people that I can get in the room with in person and just feel totally mm. comfortable with, like to what we were talking about before, um, which uh yeah it's a super important thing when it comes to this kind of what stuff what are you looking but, for when you collaborate with somebody like how do you know is it just a feeling that you go off of that you're like i want to try to make something with this person yeah i think like i mean i haven't done that many collaborations but the people that i, I have worked with <laughs> i've just really been into their music and inspired by what they're doing and kind of thinking like what what can this person bring to a song that i'm working on and, and really take it to the next level um so yeah that was kind of the case for all these like for by your side um that was a guy named taylor in in the uk who is also a really talented songwriter um i did a remix for satin jackets uh, a year ago and taylor was the singer on that song and i was like man this is such a beautifully written song and he sounds so good and so I just reached out to him after doing the remix. I'm like, do you want to work on, on an original? Um, and then wait for the moment. That's another song with buzz. Uh, and she is just like an incredible human, incredible yeah. songwriter. She's written for, you know, Katy Perry and a bunch of other uh, big name artists. And, um, I just DM'd her <laughs> enough times that she eventually was like, <laughs> I love to work on this. So, um, so yeah, I'm usually just looking for something like an element that, um someone can bring to the table that uh that i i i can or i think they can do something better than than, than i would do in yeah. a certain situation I'll, i want to play that song uh wait wait for the moment with buzz that you just mentioned um but first i want to sure. do a shout out real quick to the uh adobe listeners those of you who are listening on the radio right now um my guest is van deluxe and he's a multi-instrumentalist producer and vocalist based well, originally from Vancouver. He Now he's in San Francisco. And we are featuring his album, When the Light Breaks. And I just want to make a note that if you're listening on the radio, uh, the full video version of this conversation is available on Spotify, Apple um, Podcasts, YouTube, all of the streaming services. So you can, And also you can go to um, Adobe's website for that. But, okay, so I'm going to play a little bit of uh, Wait for the Moment. I like the mallets in this, by the way. I think they're really pretty dreamy. Oh, thanks. Yeah, lots of reverb. Yeah, a lot, but <laughs> just yeah, really beautiful sound. And and I I like the moment where she's saying, "I can't let you wait for the moment." And you've got the mallets playing with her. All right. Mm -hmm. Very dreamy. Interesting. It it 
like when you listen to it and, and then it has character in it that it's unexpected. Like I, every once in a while I get like a little hint of Bjork, like just a little, little hint of that. I think it's really interesting, and I, I you've got like layers of vocal throws in the background, the guitar, yeah, it's mm-hmm. really nice. What what can you tell us about this record? Um, you know, the instrumental to start with came from. Um, I started working on it right after um, the last Odessa record came out, and I think I was like, I, I listened through the record. I was like, man, it's pretty wild, and. I was like, what, like, what would it be like to like write a song that kind of sounds like an Odessa song, you know? And that's, that's where the origination came from. And, um, I was just messing around on, uh, on a Juno again and kind of came up with that mallet riff. And then there's a lot of, um, I mean, the, the lead vocals are all buzz, but I sort of had some like vocal stuff that i just recorded and then sampled and and threw reverb on and kind of hidden in the backgrounds to give it a bit of like an ambience or like rather than using strings it's a lot of just like heavily reverbed vocals that are sitting behind the instrumental um and yeah but i couldn't figure out a top line like i i had an idea for top line but i didn't love it and reached out to buzz and she sent this through and actually these vocals that she sent through i think that was her just like really quick throwing a demo together of like what about mm-hmm. something like this? And and I, I heard it. I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. And I started working it in and, and um, you know, kind of got all the mixed levels right and everything. And then she was like, okay, cool. Let me do like the real version. And I'm like, no, nah, just like, I'm yeah. just going to use this. this. This sounds great. Like, let's not touch it. And um, so she's like, oh, okay, fine. And um, so we just released it as, as it is. But that's the nice thing about really talented trained singers is um usually they can do these things on the first take and and often like the first take is the best like the more polished one is is not always the the best so um so yeah i love what she sent through from i was gonna say that exactly what you just said like there's so many times where the original demo vocal is just you go with that because there's something about it that's so free and carefree in the moment and it's not trying to be anything it's just getting the idea down and there's something about like trying to go back and do a, a redo, a retake and kind of recapture that sometimes it, you just, it's just better to go with the original. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Where is she based out of Buzz? Yeah. I think she's okay. based out of LA. Um, I don't know where she's from. Like we, this is like a, a fully just straight yeah. online uh, connecting over Instagram and uh connection so i've never actually met her in person but i've just been fascinated by by her and all her music and everything so uh but yeah i think she's based in la um okay i want to ask you what's what's the timeline of your your music career because you know like your numbers are great right now you've got i think you're at like two and a half million streams on spotify and and it's just so interesting to me that like you're you're your music's doing so well and like you're just you've just started touring and how long how long how long ago did you start with the music and like how long and like yeah. how long were you going as an independent artist before things really started to take off for you was it a real slow build over years and years mm-hmm. or was it like a sudden thing yeah i mean so i guess the first song the first production and song that i released i think it was on spotify or on um, soundcloud was uh six years ago maybe seven years ago but i sort of started doing just like bootleg remixes and hype machine was a big thing at the time and i was just trying to do like these like fun like 90s hip-hop style remixes with like totally different production uh to try to get on the hype machine charts just for fun you know and then um I had, there was this one month where I think I had like two or three songs that hit the number one spot on Hype Machine. And that helps to uh, stir up some uh, sort of like some underground interest, I guess, in in the stuff that I was creating and, and, um, you know, started to get messages from people. And I'm like, oh, there's actually like a listener, a bit of a listener base here. And what if I did an original? And then so um, there was a multi-year period where I was just... You know, I would release like one song every six months or a year, found out how to get them on Spotify. And it was just like a passion project and something fun to do after work. 
um, it wasn't really until I guess like this time last year or a year and a half ago where I started to take it a bit more seriously and thought like, you know, I'd love to actually do an album and try to put like this cohesive piece of work together. Um, I mean, I did do a few EPs, like four songs, five songs before that, but I didn't feel like I had like a real body of work that I could be like super proud of. And, um, so, so yeah, so that came out, I think it was September last year was the first like, full album and mm. full piece of work where I felt like an artist, yeah, you know, official. like felt like really hold on to. Um, and because we released a few of the singles before that and the singles had some good momentum mm. and traction that that's what sort of then kicked us into touring and, and taking it a bit more seriously. So even like, like I, it was, I guess, September last year where I started, where I kind of left my, nine to five job and started doing this full time and haven't, uh, haven't looked back since this transition is so interesting about, um, leaving, leaving our nine to fives and transitioning, um, something I didn't realize how common of a experience this is until the show. And I've, I was interviewing, been interviewing guests on the show and like, I've had people on the show, like we, I had, um, Scarlet opera on, and um, they were sharing their story and like they're signed to Republic Records. And, um, you know, like um, the the lead singer, uh, Lucas, telling me about how like the day they got signed to Republic Records, he signed his deal and then he changed in his car into his um, serving outfit and then went to work. And he's like, you know, waiting tables and stuff, you know, but he's like signed to a major label. But yet he's still, you know, and, and they were saying um and then the uh, the guitarist, or no, the keyboardist um, was saying that they they didn't realize this, but they they thought the hard part is getting signed. But but then somebody in the industry told them like, no, the hard part is where you're you're signed, where you're so busy, where you're not quite it's kind of like that transition where you're 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 really busy with your music career, but you're not quite bringing in the money to leave your nine to five so you're you're kind of balancing the two you know and it's kind of like slowly making that transition is is, is a challenge in today's you know today's time yeah i totally agree. yeah yeah it's funny like i think um i guess it kind of depends what you want to get out of it and why you're doing music but for me when i when i was working my nine to five up until very recently music was kind of like that was the stressful part of my day and then I would get home and I'd work on music and that was like my yoga or my drug or whatever you want to call it. That was my way of like unwinding for the day and relaxing and, and sort of my form of meditation. And so I think it, they complemented each other really well. Um, it was also nice to be working full time and not having to worry about like, am I making enough money off of this thing that I'm passionate about? And when you're not relying on money, for the thing you're passionate about, it means you have like total creative freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, you know? And so I think, I think this album is a result of having that creative freedom, not feeling like I'm tied to like the certain sound or doing exactly what the label wants or whatever. You sort of have this, like this freedom and it's like, well, if, you know, if it doesn't connect, whatever, I've still got a day job. Um, but like to your point, eventually it becomes to the, like, it, I've got to the point for me where I'm like, I just don't, like, I want to put more time into the music stuff and there's momentum here, but I don't have the time. And I also have like a relationship and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to jeopardize that. And so you eventually have to have to make a, a decision, but it was more, it was more about like timing and not having the time for both than it was like, um, like money or anything like that. Yeah, that's so cool that you got to make this album and not have to worry about like um, trying to make something that's going to be successful or even worrying about what people think. Like I love, I love when I when I hear um, interviews with Rick Rubin and he always says like um, the audience comes last. Don't ever try to make art for the totally. audience. You got to make it for yourself because a, lo a lot of a lot of times the audience like, doesn't know what they want. They don't know what they're they don't know what they they don't know what they're missing out on. You know, like if you ask them what they want. They'll, they'll, they'll give you an answer, but it's like, it's much better for you to be making something that you love. Cause if you love it, then chances are other people will love it too. Yeah, I totally. And I think like it, you know, I struggle with feedback as well because you always like, you, you're taught like, Oh, you, you have to take feedback and it's always good to have feedback and feedback, feedback. But 
the reality is like when when you show your music to other people their first reaction for feedback is usually going to be like oh you should do it like this because that's what yeah. they've heard before you know they they're thinking of a song they're thinking of something even subconsciously that they've heard before and so they want to kind of mm-hmm. steer you in that direction and so the more feedback you take as an artist the more you kind of just start to create this sound that people have probably heard before and they want and they want to hear but like in reality the stuff that at least the stuff that i connect with is the stuff that kind of makes me uncomfortable the first time i hear it because it's different and it's weird and i haven't heard it before but then like those songs yeah. grow on you and they become they end up becoming your favorite songs so i don't know i'm a strong supporter in artists like just totally doing their own thing <laughs> like you know doing doing making music for themselves and what they want to cuz then it's like a true expression of who you are just not um you know who your friends want you to be or or who you think you should be it's just like directly who Go you are go in your bubble you know? make your art and then put it out and then people can deal with it <laughs> totally yeah yeah um okay last question when you're making your music uh, you were talking about before you had your nine to five and then you come home and do the music. I was curious that I was wondering like how much time are you very structured when you're making your music or are you able to like, are you able to work on it in, in little doses or not? I ask this because when I start working on something, I have a hard time stopping. I can go like hours and hours and hours into the night and like, I really have trouble just stopping and going to bed. And usually I'll stop when I'm like exhausted. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to sleep now. But some people are very, regimen like they can just work on it for a few hours and stop and then go about their day what's it like for you yeah it's a good question um when when i was working sort of regular nine to five there was an element of structure in my life that i had to continue to be structured in order to make music because if you're not structured and you just do it when inspiration hits you're not going to have enough time for it because it'll probably hit in the middle of the day when you're working you know and um so i think i had structure and then when i started doing music full time i sort of dropped all that structure which was nice but i it, it made me realize i actually need that structure like i'm I, I work better when i sit down and carve out time to be creative than just like waiting for inspiration cuz um yeah sometimes inspiration hits when you don't have that time and then there's nothing you can do um but I recently, my wife and I recently had a baby uh, about eight or hey, nine weeks congratulations. ago. Congratulations. That's uh, awesome. Wow. Which is a whole other life experience that um, has been really, really exciting. But uh, it's reintroduced that structure into my life because uh, now uh, my daughter uh, structures my life. And, uh, you know, you find little pockets to work uh, within that. But surprisingly, it, it's made me more productive since then because it's kind of reintroduced the structure that i think i'm a little more comfortable with or was previously so i've actually written sort of more music that i'm proud of in the last six to eight weeks than i did during the entire three months before that when i wasn't working and had no structure so there must have been such a shift between writing this album and then now the music you write and now you have a daughter probably everything's different now Oh yeah. I mean, everything's different for sure. Um, but in, you know, it's not like, yeah, there's challenges and it's definitely hard and there's difficult parts to it, but the highs just like totally outweigh all of the challenges of having a kid, which I didn't realize going into it. Like I didn't realize how great the high moments were and you just have this whole new inspiration to, for, for, and for music and all these new feelings that you can translate into music um and like there's this one song that i've just finished that um the entire baseline and like foundation of the strong is our baby's heartbeat when she was still in the womb and when when we're at the doctor's office um, she let me like sample it (laughs) i love that i had this sample it was kind of like you know it's like 135 <laughs> 140 bpm that's like, great um so yeah it's been fun to uh just experience all oh, that i can't wait to hear this please whenever it's out or you have something that send it to me i'd love to i'd love to hear it i will i'll send you i'll send you a little Yay, link before it gets out so beautiful and what perfect timing too it's like 
she's really lucky to your daughter to she's growing up with a dad who followed his dreams and he saw them through and he's having success and he's you're leading by example you know you're showing her like what what's possible in her own life yeah i hope she sees it that way i think like i think the one thing that i've learned late is that the most important thing in life for me is like finding something that you're passionate about and really leaning into it. And, and I feel super lucky because like I have found something that I'm super passionate about, but like a lot of people don't find that passion and it's, it's not a given. And, um, you know, if you, there's, you know, there's stuff people like, but like to be really passionate about something, to be thinking about it, like all day, thinking about when you're asleep, be excited to work on it when you wake up the next day, I think it's pretty rare and um you know my guess is that my daughter hopefully will f find something she's passionate about it probably won't be music it'll probably be something else but i want to make sure that like i'm encouraging her to just like totally lean into that because that's where happiness is going to come from and success and all these things so um that's been my biggest takeaway at least in my <laughs> early yeah. stages of parenthood um, when people ask me about finding their passion, I, I always tell them that you have to try different things. Like you can't just sit in your bedroom on, and, and in your head figure out what your passion is in your mind. You're only going to figure it out by trying different things. It's through like the experience yeah. of trying it, and then you can see like what your what what is like what is like um, energizing you. Like you said, where you start thinking about it all the time, and 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 it's on your mind and. That's the only way to find out what you're passionate about. So just try a bunch of different things. And for me, like I always say, like that's what your 20s are for. A lot of times, it's just like try a bunch of different shit and see what see what energizes you. Yeah, I could, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's often it's like a slow burn. It's like just it's trying everything and the stuff that you're interested yeah. in, continuing to try those things, and making sure you carve out time to like keep doing those things that you're intrigued by and um yeah yeah hopefully that leads to a passion yeah. right and it's never too late too I, I mentioned 20s but it really can happen at any age really any age and that's the other thing too is like i tell people you, we don't really know how long we're gonna live i think our generations i think the average age is gonna be i think we're gonna have a lot more since uh people that get make it to 100 with the advancement of with AI and medicine and stuff. And so like, I even think about that myself. I didn't start DJing until I was 30. And, but then I think like, I would hate to be later on in life. I would hate to make a decision now thinking like, oh, I'm too old for this. And then late, and then I end up living way longer than I ever thought I was. And then look back and be like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Why did I stop that path? Because I thought I was too old when really I was only like a third of the way through my life. And I thought I was halfway through my life, you know? So I, I really try to like encourage people not to focus on age or the timing of where they're at in their life. Like it's never too late to really start to find your passion and lean into it. I completely agree. I have somebody told me once, uh, the best, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. And the second best time yeah. is today. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, it's never too late. Like today's better than tomorrow. And, um, I don't know, man, like 40 is the new 50, 30, no, 50 is the new 40, 40 is the new 30, it's whatever. So true. It's like, we're all going to live, like, just, yeah, just get it after it. If you're passionate about it, just when go When we're old, it. I bet, I bet it's going to be like, so, oh, I, I, uh, you know, I need it. My heart is like, you know, I need a new heart. And then you just go to the doctor and they grow you a new heart and then you get a new, you get like a new organ. I, I think, you know, we're going to have CRISPR. We're going to be editing our genes. I know it's, I, we're gonna we're gonna all be yeah. Benjamin Button by the time uh, we're old, you know. Start growing backwards. Who knows? AI. It's, it's all gonna wild. take over. All right, we're we're coming to the end of the show. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. That was that was fun. That was I, a good time. Adobe combo. listeners, my guest is Van Deluxe, and if you if you didn't catch the full interview, um, you can watch the full video version of this conversation on streaming, Spot, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Um, I want to encourage everyone to to check out Van Deluxe, uh, his music online. The album that we are featuring is When the Light Breaks. Uh, for those of you watching online, we're gonna link uh, we're, we're linking to your socials in the descriptions, so they can just click through and connect with you. Great, but Evan, thank you for coming on Life Rhythms. Really pleasure talking with you.
Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, that was great. It was really great, great. to connect. Okay, everyone. See you next time.